Hi, I'm Chris Price, and today I'm going to talk to you about GPT-3. How do you go about getting creativity from determinism? We're going to cover off tokens. That's the fundamental building blocks of the transformer model architecture. Then we're going to talk about what the transformer model architecture is. And then we're going to talk about how you go from a deterministic process to a process that uh, inspires creativity. So at first, tokens. So tokens are how the model translates from a representation it understands, which are the numeric identifiers on the bottom, um, into a representation or from a representation that we understand, so uh, plain text. And in, you can see in this example, there's a clear alignment between uh, words, which I guess you could consider the primitive of our language, and uh, the tokens, which primitive of uh, the OpenAI model. However, in other cases, it's not quite as clear cut. So you can see that some words are encoded as one token, but supercalifragilisticexpialidocious is very much not. And it's encoded as runs of, uh, runs of letters that it does recognize or fragments of a word that it does recognize. You can also see that uh, leading white space is sometimes included, as is capitalization. So it's not as simple as just a straightforward mapping of, of word or, or letter to numeric identifier. It is more complex than that. Before we go any further with explaining the transformer architecture, I'm just going to use a, introduce a couple of helper functions. And these helper functions will allow us to describe these, these upcoming architectures. So first up, we've got um, token. So this is just a function which takes um, the, the, the string sum and returns the equivalent token. And then we've also got tokenize. And tokenize takes a string of words and converts it into a list of tokens. So I've already mentioned the transformer architecture. What is the transformer architecture? Well, the transformer architecture is uh, an, the novel part of the OpenAI models. And at its core, it's about using parallelization and removing internal state to allow for faster uh, training times which ultimately means you can train much more complex models, um, which as evidenced by the GPT models. So the transformer architecture fundamentally uh, is about taking a string of tokens as its input. Sorry, not a string, a list of tokens as its input and predicting a single token, which is the next token that it would expect to come after that sequence of tokens that you've passed in. So in this case, when presented with the tokens corresponding to once upon a, it's gonna respond with the token corresponding to time. In its training data, that was the most common word to follow once upon a. But how do you go about generating more than just the, the next token? How do, you, how do you move on and how do you generate paragraphs of text or um, what have you? The way you do that is you feed back the generated token into the input, remembering that it's a stateless process, it's a pure function. So you take the output, you concatenate it onto the input, and then you feed it through the model again. And again, if we, if we do that, here you see that the most likely next token is comma, which again, makes sense. That will have been uh, very obvious in the, in the training data. That then introduces uh, two of the parameters which you often see associated with GPT models, so response length and stop sequences. The meaning behind these becomes much more obvious when you realize that the model itself, all it's doing is predicting the next token. So to produce, multi uh, to produce paragraphs of text or uh, a given length, you're effectively just invoking the model recursively uh, a given number of times. Uh, similarly with stop sequences, stop sequences are about looking for sequences uh, that are generated at the output of the model. And if you see a run of this uh, uh, tokens that you recognize as a stop sequence, you, you abort the iteration. The big point here is that the model is deterministic. If for a given input, it will always give you the same output. And that's that that's uh, a nice thing, I think. Uh, certainly the first time I came across it, this felt nice to me. This is 
a lot of the, the kind of black magic of AI suddenly starts to disappear if you realize that your model is effectively just a deterministic function. But that also flies <laughs> in the face of what we've all observed. We've all seen examples of GPT generating much more impressive creative endeavors. So how do you go about generating creative output? Well, it turns out that I've been talking about things in a slightly simplified manner. So I've talked about it that the model takes a sequence of input tokens and it generates the next most likely output token. Uh, and in fact, it generates a little bit more than that. Not only does it generate the most likely next token, but it also tells you the relative probability of that token being next. And it's actually a little bit more complicated still because it doesn't just tell you the next token and its relative probability, the most likely token and its relative probability it actually tells you for every token that the model is aware of, the probability that it is the next token. So for the vast majority of tokens that the model's aware of, those probabilities are gonna be really, really very small. But for a few, they are gonna be a bit higher. And then in this case, there's a, there's a very significant one in uh, the example of time. But then you can also see that the others are uh, could be relatively likely. So um, time with a capital T, I guess that's just with the casing confused. And then midnight, I think that's a, I think that might be a poem. Um, don't, don't ask me. So going back to where does creativity come from? Well, creativity is starting with a thorough understanding of expectations. So the model thoroughly understands uh, the expectations that we have around, I guess, the knowledge or the, the pros that it's ingested as training data. But then it takes it a step further. So what we've been talking about so far is that we've been running the model and always taking the most likely next token. But what if instead of doing that, we picked a different token, still a popular token, still a, a good suggestion or a reasonable suggestion for what could come next, but just not always picking the most popular, picking one of the few most popular, say. So in this case, we've picked the next most popular, what's once upon a midnight, and then it's predicted dreary for us. And this has taken us down a different path and produced something a little bit more creative, you could say. Now there's a few controls, well, parameters for working with the model, which actually inform this behavior. So this behavior is effectively randomly selecting the next, uh, from the next most likely uh, tokens. So this is, uh, temperature is one of those parameters. The way temperature works is it's just the likelihood that a lower probability token will have its relative probability increased. And top P only considers the top N most likely tokens having a cumulative probability of P. So in both cases, they're effectively just adding randomness to Push the, um, push the loop away from always selecting the most likely next token. It's effectively just selecting the less well-trodden path. And then what happens if you run this process a number of times? So you, you pick the less well-trodden path and you keep generating M sequences of N tokens. Then what you could do is you could work out the cumulative probability across those generated sequences to work out which of those sequences in, in, uh, in whole has the highest probability of being, uh, being uh, a, a good prediction of what could have come next. If you do that, then you've effectively generated a few ideas and then you've picked the best. So rather than always picking the best at the next turn, you generate a few and then you pick the best overall suggestion. So that's really interesting because what we've done there is we've we've started with a model which was a black box which seemed like magic and was generating creative answers of effectively infinite length and we've peeled it apart and we've seen that the models despite their vast complexity they're actually just deterministic pure functions and that was that was reassuring to me because that yeah that really is um, that's how I'm used to thinking of computers. There's no magic really going on here. All they're doing is deterministically predicting the next outcome. 
And that, that, that's a good thing. But then I guess the way we talked through it was that creativity starts with a comprehensive understanding of expectations and then chooses to take a less well-trodden path. And then repeating the process requires more effort, but can improve the result. So by ranking the ideas and selecting the best. And that's, that's a very accurate description of how the models derive creativity. But then the philosophical side of me also starts thinking, that seems really like how, how we as humans derive creativity from determinism. And then, then that starts you thinking about um, maybe, maybe we're not that special after all. But anyway, leaving the philosophy aside, thanks for listening. You can read more about my thoughts on AI on uh, the Scott Logic blog. I definitely encourage you to check out the computer file episode on AI language models and transformers by Robert Miles. He's also got an excellent channel of his own on AI safety.